4,100. When you enter entering this room, I think you may be wondering why I'm showing you this number. You may have some guesses why. Actually, for us in OVH Cloud, this number is a number of instances that we are running right now in our infrastructure. Infrastructure that's spread between more than 30 regions in 10 locations between eight countries. And you may be wondering why I'm giving you these figures. I want you to understand on how of a big scale we are running our OpenStack Cloud. This scale gives us a unique view on the challenges, on issues, and on problems that we are facing each day, and especially on issues and problems that we are faced during our last three years. Last three years, that was like a journey for us, a journey that led us to a point when we integrated L3 services, so distributed virtual routers, floating IPs, and external gateways into one of the biggest OpenStack clouds. My name is David, and together with my colleagues, Mohan and Michal, and with our combined 25 plus of experience in cloud computing, we'd like to invite all of you to come to the journey together. So I hope you're ready. Let's buckle at seatbelts and move on. To start, we need to take a few years back to the point when at OVH Cloud, we had no OpenStack at all. At that moment, what we are our cloud-like service was physical servers to rent. For those type of servers, we are, we are offering our clients two types of networking. First type of network was public network. And for this network, there is one particular feature that was kind of hard to then implement in OpenStack world, that is IP directly on the host. So when someone is ordering a server and on the manager side, he sees that the given IP is being given to his private server. Then when SSH into that server, he also sees this IP on one of his interfaces. And of course, next to public networking, we provided private networking. And for private networking, we developed technology called Virtual RAC, or VRAC for short. And this technology uh, enables layer two networking between two private servers, no matter where are they. It can be the same rack, it can be two racks, it can be two data centers hundreds of miles apart. So on. in other words, it, from the server point of view, it looks like all of the other servers are connected to the same top of rack, that's the name virtual rack. And I would really like you to focus on those two features because when we start thinking, OK, we need to bring virtual machines, so OpenStack Cloud, to our offering, there's one requirement that we would like our, our current customers to have the same experience with virtual machines as they have with physical servers. So we need to figure out a way how to, for public networking, present IP directly on the host, and for, virtual, for private networking, how we can have it connected with virtual rack so that it will appear like all VMs are connected to the same top of rack switch. So that's what, we've, what, that's what we designed. So for public networking, which we called uh, BGP network, for each instance that uh, our client is uh, starting, we are also plugging an instance bridge. This is an obvious bridge, so we have one bridge per each instance. Then all of these instance bridges are connected to one external bridge, but between them we have a namespace, network namespace, and in this namespace we have one IP tables firewalling, secondly we have routing to that particular instance, and thirdly we also have here DHCP to serve those IP that this given instance would have. And then all of the instances are connected in external bridge. And then all of the traffic, all of the IPs are being announced to the top of rack. And also here we also need to have routing to have route to every instance that we have lying on the host. And I hope that you are not uh, tired of diagrams because there's one more. And the other one is for the private networking. So that's what we designed to connect our OpenStack instances into the VRAC network. VRAC network on its like very basic 
uh, if we look on it like on a very basic concept, it's just VLAN in VLAN. So we just took a VLAN networking concept and we added on top of it into another VLAN. So from instance, it works like the same as some VLAN networking on integration bridge, you have some kind of local VLAN. Then when coming from integration to external bridge, we are applying customer VLAN. But then before exiting the node, we need to pack it into customer, we need to pack customer VLAN into VRAC VLAN. Then it goes through top of rack. Then in OVH network, it's all connected via VXLANs that are not visible for customers. And then it enters the other node. We need to unpack from this VRAC VLAN. Then customer VLAN is translated to local VLAN and back to instance. And we need to apply this customer VLAN in the middle, even though it seems to not be used in this use case, because the VRAC network is not only connected, connecting our instances, but it is also connecting OpenStack instances with physical servers. And on physical server, this uh, customer VLAN would be seen on the interface. Thus, we need to also pack all of the packets into this VLAN. So, this is what we came, came and uh, produced when needed to introduce OpenStack Cloud. And now I'd like to invite Michal to explain you what we had to change and what challenges we have once we were introducing our free services. Thank you, David. Hi, I'm Michal. And we're going back to 2019 when our infrastructure is on OpenStack Newton. Newton is end of life, so we need to go with next release, and we decided to go with Stein. Uh, the networking part that David explained is implemented as multi-agent solution, and the code base of the multi-agent based on Newton code. So it's really difficult for us, painful, to upgrade to Stein. And the last concern that we have is that we want to introduce L3 services for our customers. So, how we achieved that? The first step was to split agent multi, to multiple Neutron plugins. So, the first one is BGP agent, that is our completely our solution, OVH solution, and we're using Quagga software for IP announcement. Second agent is VRAC agent, and this is the plugin that OpenStack is using, using for VLAN connectivity, but we implemented their VLAN in VLAN solution, so the VRAC networking that David explained. And of course, we need to introduce L3 agent to prepare L3 connectivity, L3 services for our customers. So the plan was to kill two birds with one stone, upgrade agents to Stein, and introduce L3 services. And now, this time we are smarter, because we implemented our agents as different Neutron plugins. So it will be really, really easier to upgrade to next releases. So after splitting, BGP agent doesn't change at all. But soon after the splitting, we will introduce some features to BGP agent to announce external gateways and floating IPs. There will be diagrams for it. So how our agents are distributed around our region. So of course we need the neutron. So usually let's say we have from two to three neutron servers. So we have neutron RPC and neutron API. We need network nodes. And at OVH we called them SNAT nodes. We have all three agents there. And L3 agent is working there in DVR SNAT mode. And of course, sorry, and of course we need computes. Uh, we have also three agents there. Uh, L3 agent is running there in DVR mode. And on this slide, we can see how our typical region looks like. Of course, the number of computes can be different. But we can also handle uh, regions with 2,000 computes. And in this particular region, we have like seven neutron servers. So what we did uh, to introduce L3, L3 service. So uh, the first thing was to tune BGP agent and VRAC agents. BGP agent now can handle 
L3 ports, so announce the L3 ports, so the floating IPs and external gateway ports. And also VRAC agent is doing small part when we want to use uh, floating IPs because it's configuring L2 connectivity for us. So tuning of the agent. Another thing, the problem that default behavior of Linux kernel is causing for us. If we attaching new IP on some interface, when we adding new IP to some interface, uh, kernel creates a new default route by default. And if some customer will choose the same IP range that we're using for our internal connectivity to top of rack, our networking can be broken. This is not an issue that OpenStack has because there is no VRAC in OpenStack, but it is on a VH. So we needed to tune L3 agent to remove that rule. And the last thing, of course, is to plug, plug uh, L3 namespaces, so floating IP namespace, SNAT namespaces, Qruter namespaces into our stack. So a lot of work related with creating proper routes by L3 agent. So this is how our stack looks like if we're talking about floating IP. So we have an instance, and from that instance, we want to go outside uh, with outside traffic so to external world. So of course, from the instance through the integration bridge, we need to go to the Qrouter because we, it's private networking, so we are plugged into some private, uh, private network, so into router. And from there, we need to go to the floating namespace. And this is the part that L3 agent configured for us. There we have this small part where the VRAC agent uh, configures routes for us and uh, untags the VLAN. And already prepared routes by BGP agent and announcement allows us to go outside of our rack, so to the internet. So a few years before, actually, we implemented at OVH something like floating IPs. And this is our own solution uh, implemented as neutron service. It's IP failover, it's marketing name, or IP alias, it's internal technical name. Uh, the idea was also to allow our customers to attach IP to private, uh, private servers, bare metal instances, so generally also for private cloud. Now we're going with OpenStack floating IPs and we decided to keep those two solutions. So we support both of them. The biggest difference is that in IP aliases, customer needs to add the IP manually on the interface. In floating IPs, everything is done by uh, proper routing that we configure, and it's transparent for our customers Just need to attach the IP on panel. So what is happening if there is no floating IP attached, but we want to have connectivity with external world? So we can configure external gateway. So how it works at OVH. So we have an instance, and the traffic wants to go outside to the internet. So as you can see, by our VRAC network, <coughs> we're going to different node. It's our network node, so the SNAP node. So by VRAC networking, we're going to the integration bridge and to SNAP namespaces, where we prepared our routes that are needed to allow this traffic to go out. So that is the VRAC part where, where we're doing untagging. And there, BGP announcement is done by our BGP agent, so um, we can go out with our traffic. So at this point, everything looks fine from architectural point of view. Everything should work. But then, new challenge appear. Uh, we have new customer needs. We want to introduce Octavia load balancing. So we have two problems here. So the first problem is that uh, VIP, 
port of Octavia load balancer is down and unload all the time. This is how it, this is designed in OpenStack. Uh, so we needed to learn our BGP agent how to handle this kind of ports, because previously it doesn't care at all about ports that are in down state. Second problem is that uh, VIP of Octavia Load Balancer is present on the interface in the SNAT namespace where the router is active. So in SNAT node somewhere. So we needed somehow uh, introduce a solution that allow us to go with this traffic outside. So it also is done on BGP level, a BGP agent level by giving customers possibility to attach floating IPs to this VIP load balancing ports. So now, from architectural point of view, everything is done. But of course, we introduced some bugs and problems. And Mohan, can you explain what happened next? Thank you, Mehul, for the wonderful details. With the consider of scale what we are operating, introducing a new challenge in our infra is not an easy job. With the help of our dedicated SRE and the dev team, we are able to face it. For the better interest of our time, I like to share rather uh, three uh, recent challenges what we are facing in our infra. So, so these are the challenges I'm going to talk about. The first challenge is duplicate packets with multi-region routes. So before jumping into the challenge, uh, I'd like to highlight a few uh, details about our infra. So we have a VRAC network, it's basically a private network, and we are trying to reach a router that sits on different region from a VM that's in local region. So it means there is no local router so, uh, to answer back your request. So how it looks like, here you can see on the region one, we have a router and a VM. So the VM is trying to reach a route, uh, router's gateway. It's very much local and we are seeing a single request it's everything looks fine now. So here we are seeing some weird issue. We are trying to reach a different region router. So then we see multiple duplicate packets. It means uh, there is something wrong with the infrastructure. We need to do it. So when we analyzing the issue, sorry, I mean, analyzing the issue, we figured out, so we have something here the private VRAC network, it basically try to distribute a uh, request to all the routers that sits in different regions. Here you can see on the region B, we have a node one and we are VM on a local and we don't have any router. So this VM, if trying to talk to a uh, router that sits in node two, then the VRAC network actually is rather sending requests direct to node two, it's actually distributing to all the routers, hence all the routers are replying back with their duplicate request. So uh, we still are uh, trying to solve this issue uh, because it's, it's kind of an issue with uh, no multi-regions. We try to um, address with the, what's the best use case we can solve. So the second challenge, what we see is we are not able to reach metadata service. So, so how actually the metadata service works in upstream is we have an instance. When an instance is actually uh, Posted on a network that is connected to a router, so then a router is know uh, how to serve the metadata service request. So in our service, in our uh, no case, we have so we have L3 services. So L3 service is taking some time to set up all the routes, you know, uh, and gateways to to host the proxy. So uh, when the instance is booting up, it taking you no know, the cloud in its script is taking, no, uh, trying to reach the uh, router's namespace to reach the metadata service. So that time it was failing because there is, the router is still taking a time. So the metadata agent is supposed to be set up a metadata proxy. It's actually waiting the agents to complete all these actions. So, so after some point of time, the cloud is giving up because it's not able to find metadata service. So, how we solved it is using a diff the workaround what upstream is providing. So rather depending on the router, we try to uh, take a DHCP support for metadata service. By setting this option, force metadata equal to true, 
we actually uh, tell the uh, DHCP agent to append uh, the particular static IP on the VM space. So when the VM is trying to send a metadata request, it actually go to DHCP port, or rather going to router's gateway. So the third and final challenge, what I'm trying to describe is uh, the flapping router. So we have a BGP agent and L2 agent in place. So the BGP agent is actually depending on L2 agent to send the port binding successful message in order to complete it further actions. So this port binding is actually a complex process. It has to go through a lot of actions, a lot of queues and listeners in place to complete this binding successfully. So after this bind successful message came, the BGP agent is does the route advertisement to Quagga. So in the meanwhile, L3 agent is trying to set up a routers and HA script to check the infra is healthy and this works fine. So at this point, this everything looks fine. It works because we have a router advertisement in place and Quagga does its part. And HA scripts is trying to reach internet uh, to, to check the infra is, is healthy and looks fine. So. The issue here is sometimes the route advertisement is takes you know, uh, rather than a few, few more time than expected. So the ping fails. It means when the, when the HA script fails, the router is trying to go to the failed state. In the failed state, it's clean up all the routes, so it's going to backup mode. So in the backup mode, the router will not send any VRRP packets. So the same story continues. The other node router is trying to become a you no know, uh, from active, so it's all it also has to go through all these actions happening here. And if the router is advertisement is done on time on the other node, then it's again it's go to backup mode, meaning it's failed. It first it was reached to fail node and clean up all the routes, then it's go to backup mode. So then VRIP packet is not in a place. So again, um, the first node will again try to go to active mode. So this basically, this loop continues until or unless some, something we need to do on the improvement side of HA script. So what we did, so we basically uh, improved HA script in a, in, in a, in a, in a way, say, uh, just wait for a BGP agent to complete all its actions. So when BGP agent complete all its route advertisement or route settings, so then try to do the checks what we go, what we are trying to do on the external side. Again, we know it's like it's, it may not be fit for all the use cases because um, the condition what we are checking for HA script is may depend on the not what exact use case was SRE try to solve. Sometimes uh, we need to say we need to fit some external checks or external uh, no. Um, Points so uh, to to depend on what exactly the meaning of failure to understand by the HA script. So we try to do with templating format so where the SRE can set up what exactly the output I want to uh, know get it from the HA script in order to make the state of failure. And the long term solution what we're looking up sync up the port status. So at any given point of time. Uh, there are the L2 agent or L3 agent should know all the port status so that they can make the internal decisions rather depending on each other. So, by doing so, we also introduce a bug. How it looks like? So, this typical um, um, the behavior. We have a one active router and one backup router on two different SNAT nodes, and SD interface, the SNAT gateway interface, is actually binded to active. Everything looks fine. And when some package upgrade happens or some installation happens, so we see some disturbance on the traffic. It means the traffic, the VXLAN traffic is actually disturbed. Because of that, the VRRP packet from, is supposed to send from active to backup, it's not reached in time or it's, it's somewhere dropped in the middle. So because of this, the backup is, has to make a decision to, to, uh, to, to go back to active. By doing so, it's sending some requests called bind SNAT gateway interface. It was successful that uh, it able to bind SD interface and it become active. Um, here again, it's a weird issue because it's not intended or it's an expected behavior to active routers at a given point of time. Again, it's, it's not a, um, it's, 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 we are seeing for a certain, you know, uh, certain amount of time, so it's able to recover back. 
when the traffic is restored. So traffic is restored, and the, the new active C, uh, OK, there is already active. It's sending VRAP packets. So I suppose to go to backup. It's, it's able to change its transition. But the SG interface is still binded to the backup node. It means when the transition happens from active to backup, there is no such request called unbound SG interface. It's, 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 there, is, there is no such event happened. So because of this, we see SG interface. I mean, the SNAT a gateway interface is still binded to backup router. And we need some manual interruption or some kind of um, uh, external uh, no, uh, canson to do that, um, to actually unbound from backup node. So with that, I shared my, the few recent challenges. And I now request David back to the stage to share our future roadmaps. Thank you, Mohan. So during this presentation, you learned a little bit of historical reason why and how we designed our network what then we changed to introduce L3 to all of this. Few challenges, just a few of dozens we have that we uh, seen during alpha and beta stages. But you may be wondering what we are going to do next. So first of all, the stuff that we described just is now in beta and we would like to go for general availability. Second thing that we would like to introduce next is load balancing as a service, so Octavia that Michal, that Michal mentioned before during the presentation. And for the more long-term goal, we are also thinking about changing how our physical network is being built so that we will have better networking and more re reliable networking. To finish things off, uh, if you are already using OVH Cloud and you're our customer, I invite you to choose the region Gran9. And on that region, we have already enabled everything that we just spoke in, in beta. And if you're not our client, or maybe you just didn't use for a while, we have a promo code. I believe it's for 50 euro that you can use during the, this month to check things out if you like OVH or not. That being said, thank you very much for coming. I wish you a pleasant rest of the summit, and thank you. <laughs> I think we have two minutes, so if there are any questions, there's a microphone. Yep. Okay. Okay. Maybe you will hear me. Yeah. Uh, I think if I get it, uh, the VRA utilizes uh, your private network to be different to uh, Windows, or uh, it goes through internet? No, uh, the VRA realizes uh, between the data center. OK, the question was how the VRA works, if it's utilizes internet connection or our internal, internal network. And the answer is that it relies on our internal network. So we have VIX and tunnels between data centers. So everything goes via, via this. And it also goes via our, our infrastructure in terms of networking, in terms of cables itself. Um, hey, thank you very much for the talk. Um, if I may ask, what are your thoughts on Octavia? Uh, and what kind of implementation are you planning on using? I mean, I'm not in the team who's working on Octavia right now, so I don't have that much of details. <laughs> I mean, we are just testing it, seeing how it works, and to, I mean, we're basically planning to bring it as a value and see what our customers are going to do with it. <laughs> Hi, yeah, nice talk, thank you. Uh, I was going to ask if you are advertising the floating IPs via this as an X hop using the, the gateway port agent, why not using Neutron Dynamic router, uh, Routing Project in the first place? Um, I'm not sure if I understood fully the question. So you're, you're advertising uh, routes to the floating IP using the gateway port agent IP as an X-hop? Uh, no, we are advertising it directly to the node when, the, when it sits. Directly connected route? Yes, yes. Okay. We are ad advertising each IP that is lying, living on given host, and we are advertising that it's on this host, and then internal routing to route it to namespace or, in, or instance. OK, uh, but still, why did you evaluate Neutron Dynamic Routing? And it didn't work for a reason? Um, I believe we did, and I don't remember the details right now why there was some, there, we seen some issue with this. I don't remember right now. I, I can check and we can get in touch and okay. dis discuss this. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, he had the same question too, so we can follow up later. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Nice. Sure. Okay. Thanks. So, okay. thank you very much. Thank you.